The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, Jennifer. It's Francis. <clears throat> There we go. Thank you, Patrick. So Patrick, I thought we could be on video while we give our introductory remarks and then um, Let's see. Yeah, I think you need to turn on your mic. I'm still not seeing a uh, microphone for you, Patrick. So uh, we'll give it another couple minutes while people log on.
And so uh, with respect to water levels, uh, next graphic here, slide six, um, people will be well familiar with this uh, 100 year history on Lake Erie of uh, historical water levels with meters on the Y axis uh, below and above chart datum. Uh, everyone knows we hit a record high last year on Lake Erie in 2019 in June. And so uh, what we're doing for the purpose of this uh, vulnerability and risk assessment, the dashed orange line is the 100-year uh, flood level or the historical 1% 1 1 chance flood. And so this incorporates not only the static lake levels, which are the blue line, but also the storm surge. So this is the combined, combined probability of, of static lake level and storm surge. It's our planning threshold uh, for new development in the Great Lakes on the Canadian side. And so the orange is the, is the historical, based on historical records, because of uh, the emphasis of this study on climate change uh, adaptation, we also look to the future. And uh, we're relying on this particular graphic on some information that was generated from Environment Canada on projected uh, future lake level conditions on Lake Erie, uh, somewhere in the order of mid-century. Uh, and that research has, has pointed to the lakes being even higher than they were in 2019. And so we've added, the dash red line is an additional half meter uh, of lake level on top of the 100 years. So for all of the work we're doing, we're not only looking at the, the old way of doing business, which is the historical 1% uh, chance or 100 year lake level based on historical records, but because of the, the lack of stationary in our climate now, we're also looking to the future and making sure that we integrate what we, uh, the best we know what the future will bring with respect to lake levels and storm events. And so that's the dashed red line. Um, I should mention that we did spend some time talking about low lake levels during the study and, and they're not to be forgotten, although that's not uh, top of mind with anyone right now. Um, and the other last thing to mention, there is some ongoing new research within Environment Canada uh, looking again at, at net basin supplies and lake levels and what is expected to happen or, or projected to happen in the future because of climate change. And that's consistent with the higher highs that we're showing here, which is the half meter higher. So for planning purposes, we need to be thinking about even higher levels than 2019. The other part that's, that's interesting about this work that's still in draft is that the research is suggesting for, especially for the higher emission scenarios, that the mean lake levels uh, could start to increase in the future. So uh, still drafts, always uncertainty about the future of our lake levels, but one of the key takeaways certainly is that we need to start planning for more extremes and what we're experiencing right now uh, on Lake Michigan Huron and we'll experience last year on the other lakes is, is not necessarily gonna be a one-off. That might become more of a normal situation. And what that means from a planning perspective is, is part of what we're trying to grapple with here in this study. All right, enough on that soapbox. So uh, temperatures, we all know that they have increased top left and they're projected to increase even more in the future, uh, atmospheric temperatures. Um, we, for this work, it's important to mention quickly that we focused on the RCP 8.5 emission scenario. We understand that traditionally you would look at the full spectrum of scenario emission scenarios. We didn't have that luxury of, of time or resources. And so we focused on this more extreme condition uh, so that we could look into the future and understand the projections as best we can and what they mean. So uh, the, all the work with respect to the climate change scenarios is focused on our CPA 0.5. Along the bottom graphic, a lot of work went into looking at ice cover and, and we're just trying to show schematically uh, a heavy ice year to middle panel half of the lake covered in ice far right-hand panel, uh, Little Ice. Um, our work, as well as, again, some ongoing work from Environment Canada, suggesting that for RCP 8.5, uh, by late century, we could have lakes that no longer have ice in the wintertime in the lower, lower system. So Lake Ontario, Lake Erie could become ice-free completely in the wintertime. And that's, we'll see in a second, will have significant implications on our coastal zone as well. So on to a, a quick overview on, on what we did with waves and, and how we translate that into looking at wave energy and impacts of storms. So this work we focused on um, some information that was generated from, from NCARV with the WARF model 
uh, climate scenarios uh, that were run um, across the grid on North America, four, four kilometer cells, so a little bit finer resolution than uh, your typical regional climate model, which is important because when we hind cast waves, we want to have really high resolution wind directions because that has a big impact on waves. Uh, and we had this information from NCAR for a 2000 to 2013 period snapshot, and then that same weather simulated late century with the RCP uh, 8.5 emission scenario assumptions, re-simulating that weather. And so we had two sets of winds on a four kilometer grid that we then used to hindcast waves on Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. Uh, and for those that are not familiar, a wave hindcast model is simply simulating wave growth and proposition, propagation on an hourly basis across the lake surfaces. For the 2000-2013 um, snapshot, we used actual ice coverage uh, from the NOAA ice charts and the data that's generated. So we're accounting for the actual ice conditions that happened 2000 to 2013. When we looked at the future for late century, uh, we took we had no ice at all. So we took the ice right out of the model so that we could say, well, what happens if the lakes never have ice cover in the future? And what does that mean for the wave climate and the amount of energy generated on the lakes? And the graphic here in the lower right is the summary of that analysis. And so this is a heat map that's comparing the uh, change in energy from the historical climate for that 13 years to here. There's a dramatic increase in the amount of wave energy that will be generated in the winter time. And so this is the winter season. Uh, the dark reds are showing at each, each one of these little boxes here is a cell on the model. 100%, 120% increase in the amount of energy that would be generated in the Western Basin of Lake Erie without ice cover in the future. Um, along the South Shore on the US side, we're in these dark oranges, that's an 80% increase. For our study area in the Chatham-Kent region, uh, 70 to 80% increase in the amount of energy reaching the shoreline when there is no longer ice on the lake, 120% uh, increase in the bay. So this is, a, is an enormous, change that's already happening and if this plays out it's going to have an enormous impact on the challenges that we already face uh, managing our shorelines in the Great Lakes. And so a couple key sort of takeaways and we really can't dive too far into this but there are some technical reports which we'll provide links to as well. Um, one of the key findings and, and fairly interesting and unexpected findings with our work so far is that the looking at the GCMs and the RCMs and, and the outputs from the WARF model, uh, when we look to the future, we don't see any uh, increase in the frequency or the intensity of the coastal storms. And so something that's often reported is your standard uh, storms are gonna become more frequent, more intense. That may be true for rainfall and it's playing out with rainfall, but with respect to these large scale uh, synoptic weather systems, we're not seeing that. So we're not necessarily seeing more storms, uh, and because pressure gradients and all the climate models are not greater in the future, we don't expect the storms to be more powerful uh, with respect to their pressure gradients, their ability to generate winds that will generate large wave heights. Uh, the other interesting thing is that storm surges into the future uh, so far with the research we've done are not projected to be greater either. Again, pressure gradients and wind, field, wind speeds are not greater in the climate models in the future. And so storm surges are not projected to be any larger than they have been historically. But there are two really important changes um, from the research so far. And that is that uh, the reduced ice cover uh, is going to be more storms are gonna make it to the shoreline. Um, so instead of having protection from lake ice in the winter, if we go to a future with no ice, more of those winter events are gonna become storms generating waves impacting the shoreline. And then this issue of, of higher net basin supplies, higher rainfall events in the future could lead to even higher lake levels than what we've experienced historically and what happened in the last couple of years, still happening right now on Michigan Huron. So uh, a couple of things that were not necessarily expected um, and some key things there about lake levels in the future and the loss of ice. Um, of course, all of those things will lead to increased flood risk, uh, accelerated erosion rates in the winter time. The graphic on the lower left is the study area, uh, Erie Shore Drive this past winter. 
and I think most of it will sort of monitor uh, the lower lakes will know that we got really lucky on Lake Erie last winter because there was basically zero ice uh, and we didn't have any really big storm events, um, certainly not a lot. Uh, so we're at record high levels in the winter and we, and we didn't, we missed uh, getting the big storm event. All right, so on to the adaptation concepts and need to go through these quickly here. Um, I just want to focus on three uh, areas and a, and a bit of the background. And so uh, we went through and focused on um, these four concepts of avoid, accommodate, retreat, and protect. And so this helped ground the development of the of the options that we came up for for the different environments, high bluff, low lying flood prone, prone areas. Uh, and so this we wanted to make sure that we we spoke to all of these different options as we considered what to do in the different geographies. And I think we all know that historically we went right to protect and armor our shoreline. And what you'll see soon here is that that's not what we've done. And we don't think that that's really the, the right approach everywhere now uh, in this study area. We also spent some time thinking uh, more creatively about transformative adaptation and given the magnitude of some of the, of, the, of the risks in this geography and other places in the Great Lakes, it is becoming time for us to start thinking about getting on this spectrum uh, and thinking about restructuring or path shifting uh, multi-scale or multi-benefit uh, concepts, things that are uh, restoring uh, natural functions, embracing nature-based solutions. Uh, so this is part of what we've done as well. There's a whole series of, of what we call calling generic options, and there's a few of them just listed on the screen here, and, and we'll send some more examples later. What I want to focus in, though, is what we've done in a couple key areas. And so first in this high bluff environment, again, highly erosive high bluffs, um, clay, glacial till bluffs, eroding uh, anywhere from half a meter to a meter per year on average, uh, but certainly eroding at a much higher rate recently. Um, one of the first things we did was generate this, and the, the key map here shows you a portion of the shoreline. This is the west shoreline. You can see the high bluffs. Uh, one of the one of the uh, components of this study that it's creating the high vulnerability is this road here, Talbot Trail. 30 kilometers of it are very close to the lake. And with the inset maps here, you can just see the proximity of that road uh, to the lake. There's one section that's already closed right now uh, because of erosion. The yellow line is an estimate of where the top of bank would be in 50 years. And when we put that line out there, uh, this was prior to having the first phase of this work done on the, on the future wave climate. And so this is not factoring in reductions in uh, ice cover in the future. It's definitely not factoring in uh, more wave energy exposure um, or higher lake levels. And so where we called this a 50 year line, an estimate of the top of bank, the yellow band, uh, but in reality, it might be closer to a 25 or a 30 year estimate. We looked at where all the infrastructure is and the roads. Uh, the next summary graphic shows you uh, three areas along the high bluff environments. Uh, the first one here, we've got about 10 kilometers, um, 150 buildings, roughly uh, $20 million of, of assets in harm's way. This large 30 kilometer section in the middle, we've got in the order of uh, $60 million uh, or $40 million of property, 100 and 300 buildings. So a lot of infrastructure at risk. Um, and what do we do? And so uh, the traditional approach is to protect. Uh, we've well, we sort of gone to this uh, approach of, well, we'll just armor the shoreline and, and deal with the risks that way. And so if we look at this entire, it's a 40 kilometer stretch. Uh, of shoreline and if we have to protect this from erosion and account for the higher lake levels due to climate change and the reduction in ice cover, we end up with this uh, very, very large rock revetment on the left. And so just to put some context here, the existing profile is the high bluff vertical, fairly vertical cliff, and then the near shore. Uh, in order to try to protect this for a 50 year planning horizon, you come up with a, an engineered design like the graphic in the lower left. Uh, to, to build that for 40 kilometers um, of shoreline would cost somewhere in the order of 600 to 900 million dollars, which is a, a massive number. Uh, in the real estate we just added up uh, on the order of 60 million dollars of, of buildings and infrastructure that you're trying to protect. And so, um, and this is a very high level concept. 
Uh, I should mention it's also not what we recommended doing, but just to put in context, uh, to try to deal with this risk in the traditional way, uh, you're looking at six to $900 million, which is an enormous number. Um, option uh, 1.3 was retreat and something that's gaining a lot more momentum in the Great Lakes and there's work in, at the federal level in Canada looking at the state of managed retreat across the country and, and what could be done to make this a more viable option. Uh, if we had to move 30 kilometers of this highway, uh, that could be done for somewhere between 30 and $40 million. Uh, so a, a fraction of the cost of trying to armor the shoreline, um, of course, not without implications for the people living right on the edge, uh, but from a cost perspective, a, a fraction of the price. Uh, even if you relocated all the buildings over the next 50, uh, 50 years, uh, you could do that, uh, everything, build the road, move all the buildings for somewhere between 40 and $70 million. So this option of retreat, which was ultimately the recommendation of the study, uh, is on the order of 10% um, of the cost of actually armoring the shoreline. I should mention right now that the municipality is uh, in the process of uh, doing a uh, environmental assessment to look at what the, the preferred approach is moving forward. All right, a little bit on floodplain, uh, flood risk areas. Um, this is a, a stretch of Erie Shore Drive, and I want to go through this quickly. Um, there's homes here on a, on a dike system. So we have Lake Erie, there's a dike, and then there's farmland below lake level here. And so the homes are on the dike. This is an old map that we were able to give a reference to pro provide some context on the changing risk profile, which is a key theme here in all this. And so uh, we've got distance on the X, depths on the Y, uh, historically, we had a dike here as we do today, and the black line is the is the lake bottom that we got from the 1938 map. We went back and surveyed it in 2019, and we came up with this uh, other line, the gray line here. Um, so it's much, much deeper here in the near shore. If we look at the 100-year lake level, historic lake level, and the depths in 38, during the 100-year flood, we have 2.2 meters of water depth. When we factor in where the lake bottom is today and then integrate the climate change additional half meter water level, now we're in a 4.3 meters of water in front of these structures. And so the depth of water because of climate change bringing us higher lake levels in the future based on those projections and the erosion in front of these walls has essentially doubled the water depth uh, and the risk in front of these homes. And so uh, some look at the at the flooding here. So uh, again, the homes along this barrier here, Erie Shore Drive, um, this is diked farmland in the back. We assume that the dikes breached for the 100 year flood. Uh, we've got areas where water flowing over the, over the road as well and compromising the dike. The bottom graphic, uh, you add that half meter of uh, additional water level for climate change and you've got sheet flow and velocity water flowing over uh, the vast majority of this road infrastructure. And so, one of the things that we've seen on this study and elsewhere as a, as a key takeaway is that because our regulatory approach is focused only on historical conditions and assuming climate stationarity, the, uh, these areas have risks at the 100 year flood level. In some cases they're high, some cases they're low. But as we add that additional half meter of water and factor in climate change impacts in the future, almost everything's in trouble. Uh, in other words, our communities have not been built to have any resilience for the future uh, potential rise in, in climate change uh, lake levels. So a uh, key takeaway, I'm sure that would be the case everywhere else around the lakes, but as we move forward and think about the lessons learned from this study and for other communities, we have to start thinking about building in some additional factor of safety with respect to our, our flood planning. All right, uh, there's only one way into the community of Erio here, and this graphic is showing you that the road is uh, completely inundated if the dikes breach, which is a major uh, uh, emergency concern here, uh, and there's a meter and a half under the climate change scenario. So some real risks here with respect to a breach, not only to the flooding that would occur, but the only ingress egress route to the Erio community is lost as well. So what do you do? Uh, again, traditional approach, well, we, we get a bunch of rocks and we build a, block, a large armor stone revetment. And given the cost to do that, um, or the depths of water here, 
the diagram on the left, you get a, a rock revetment that's massive um, on the scale of what you would do at a nuclear power plant, which is the right-hand side. Uh, the top crest of the structure would be to the roof line of the cottage or the home uh, in order to mitigate the impacts of the additional half meter of climate change and, and the wave climate. And so um, very, very costly, 60 to $80 million to do this, to protect this area, uh, which is somewhere in the order of three times the real estate assessed value of the homes you're trying to protect. And so uh, definitely not a, a positive benefit cost ratio there. Another option would be would be being more creative, and that would be the the transformative adaptation approach of renaturalizing this area, um, uh, recognizing that the risks are so high that the right approach would be to uh, take that farmland that's below lake level that used to be a marsh and make it a marsh again, uh, renaturalize the barrier there in green. Um, so we're reducing risk, uh, we're increasing resilience, creating new wetland habitat over 1,100 acres. Um, and creating a people place as well. So uh, an option here that is actually cheaper than the protect, uh, where we could use nature to increase resilience. Um, and so this was one of the options developed for this region. Of course, to do this, this is still incredibly expensive. Uh, we don't have any standing programs right now uh, in Ontario or Canada to uh, help with buyout programs. Uh, so this is not something that the municipality could move forward with alone. Uh, but if there was the right partnership, this kind of uh, work could be done. All right, and that's my last couple slides here. Uh, I want to just talk about the, the navigation channel on the Barrier Beach. Uh, so the Rondo Bay area in, in the 1800s, the whole thing was a marsh. Uh, incredibly important area for some endangered species like the spotted gar and fowler's toad. And only found in a few places along the North Shore, including this area. Um, and it's, it's in a lot of trouble. Um, the graphic here is the 1955 aerial. Uh, for context here, it was still a coal port. Uh, the beach has been growing lakeward on the west side of the jetty, as is typical. Uh, and back in 55, the east jetty was not even connected anymore because the beach had eroded back so far. Uh, the dash black line here is 1868. Uh, between 1868 and 2018, the shoreline had eroded back 650 feet. Um, so some real problems in this area. Over 160 hectares of wetlands have been lost. Uh, and just looking a little more zoomed in on a current aerial today, uh, we've got a problem in that this infrastructure, the, the navigation channel is not connected to anything anymore. We have all this wave energy coming in, sedimentation in the navigation channel. Right now the uh, barrier is breached as well, or was breached the uh, last two years. So what do you do? Um, and our our uh, recommendation on this one, again, is a, is a more of an innovative transformative approach. Uh, this is what it looks like under the 100-year flood today. The barrier is completely underwater. It no longer protects the bay. The bay is getting lake waves. Uh, we have communities like Shrewsbury here that are vulnerable to flooding. Um, and you have back flooding in Erio. You've got water flowing through this gap. Uh, with the uh, proper um, uh, study and collaboration and funding, we could restore this barrier and put it back and use nature to restore the proper function of this barrier beach ecosystem. And this is a conceptual rendering of what that could look like. You're reconnecting the East Jetty to the, to the barrier system, enhancing the width of the barrier system and cross-sectional view, it looks, looks something like this. And so uh, a very rock core, with a lot of beach nourishment to put the, the system back in place and, and um, again, create habitat, do restoration behind it. So. That's uh, the recommended approach here. I think the one thing, last thing to say is that uh, with this approach, um, we have, again, with some of the provincial funding that has come in, uh, are in the process of building a steering committee uh, of interested and in landowners and stakeholders and community members to move forward with a collaborative to actually make this happen. So uh, we're moving beyond the technical study in this particular area and, and trying to actually make something like this happen in the future for the community. So uh, Jennifer and Francis, with respect to my slides, uh, that's it. And I'll turn it over to Linda to uh, explain uh, the important aspects of all the community engagement. Great, thank you, Pat. Um, Pete, that was really interesting. Um, 
and I, I took actually took a lot of notes and I'll be interested in getting your slides after this. So um, very good. I think I've turned it over to Linda. Um, Linda, do you have that control? Linda, you might also be on mute. Oh, there we go. There. Yes, I have been muted. So thank you. Can you see my screen now? I've taken it all. I've uh, accepted uh, the switch. It still says we're waiting to view your screen. Oh, that's too bad. Well, it's there. Okay. There we go. No. There we go. Yeah, okay. yep, that's good. All right, go we ahead. ready? Yep. We're ready for part two. So thank you for the invitation and thank you everyone for um, listening to the second part of Pete's uh, and Linda's presentation here. What I'm going to do is talk about the community part. Pete gave you a sense of the technical aspects and now I'm going to share with you some of our ideas and what we did to engage with the community and actually transfer uh, some of the information out and receive information um, in from the community. Okay, so we had nine public meetings and reached about a thousand people within the Chatham-Kent um, region. Um, the the, there were three main meeting types, and I'll describe what we did um, in each of those meetings. One was introduce the project, one was talk about community resilience, and the third was to talk about adaptations. But also in reaching out to the community, we also had conversations with the Chatham-Kent Council so that the elected officials would, would be aware of what we were doing. And also as a, one of the outcomes of the public meetings and realization that we needed to engage more broadly with other levels of government, um, initiated um, the Southwestern Ontario Shoreline uh, Round Table. But why do you involve the community? Well, first of all, Pete and I were lucky enough to be able to be funded uh, through the NRCAN Adaptation Program, as well as other um, partners. But we have community leaders, such as the municipality of Chatham-Kent and the Lower Thames Conservation Authority, who know the region, who know the people, have to deal with the issues. So they're the first part of the community that have to be involved in a study on climate change adaptation. But secondly, of course, is the community and the people, um, the everyday person who lives within the community and needs to be engaged and involved in this process. So part of our vision was to try and create solutions with the community with respect to the issues that Pete outlined in his first presentation. And I'll just share with you right up front some of our key messages or key themes of what we wanted to um, address in the project, but also um, make the community aware of. So the first one is we genuinely wanted to engage with the public and the community uh, in our work and we wanted to inform them and we also wanted input. Um, and I think, I think we achieved that. I think we were very lucky at the openness and the professionalism of our, our lead community, community leaders, but also the genuine interest of the public at large. We also had some key ideas that we wanted to have informed not only our research or the research done on adaptation, but make its way into the community as well. So we wanted the community appreciate that coastal erosion and high and low lake levels create vulnerability, impacts and future risks. And that we also really wanted them to understand that climate change is occurring and is enhancing risks and expanding the risk zone. I think one of the key things that we wanted to have on the table is that we need to do things differently. There's a, a real um, focus on personal property or my, my piece of the shoreline. And what we really wanted to have the community appreciate is that there's a need 
to think differently, to plan for the future, adapt, and as Pete has already identified, think in a transformative way. How do we work with the shoreline? And we also wanted to impress upon people that are the coast or our shoreline is a system. And you saw that with the, the graphics with the movement of sediment. And lastly, we really wanted to stress um, three things that our actions, they need to create community, not just individual, but community resilience. Um, in designing, this next um, graphic shows that um, in designing our sort of outreach and engagement with the public, that there are, are resources available, such as for the International Association of Public Participation. And they, we access some of their information to understand what are the different public participation goals. And that's the top row where you want to inform or consult, involve, collaborate, and empower. And along the bottom um, um, row, you'll see examples or tools of how you actually do that. And then the bottom little bubbles are sort of an identification that within our project, that were certain aspects of informing, such as the Chatham Kent website or news releases that we inform the public. And in, consult, in consultation, you might have the survey or questions and answers during our presentations and public meetings. We involve them in sort of deciding on community um, criteria for assessing the adaptations. And then actually, lastly, talking about the adaptation concepts, discussion and evaluation. So the next piece I'm going to talk to is actually give you a, a, a vision or a, an, um, a walk into are some of our meetings and what we did. So the first meeting that we held was the community meeting number one, April 10th, 2019, where we wanted to introduce the project. And we had planned to have two, two hour sessions and we um, organized at the, um, in, in the area at the fire hall and it could accommodate about hundred people sitting in an auditorium style. And we had an absolutely overwhelming response. Um, the first um, number was over. We had to cut off at 100 people and then send people away and say, could you come back at 3.30? Because we had to um, organize a, a, a third um, meeting to, to accommodate everyone. So that we had about almost, we had more than 250 people for our first um, introducing to the project. And we had a format where we had two presentations. The first one provided climate change information, started at, at the big global scale, but then also provided exactly um, trends in Chatham-Kent and then projections for Chatham-Kent. But the two, the two main points that the pre that presentation delivered was that there are four adaptation solutions that we are going to explore for our coastal area, and that's accommodate, avoid, protect, and avoid uh, uh, retreat. And so we also talked about um, climate change adaptation can be when you change the way you do things and and um, explore solutions, you can use climate change adaptation as a catalyst for creating resilient communities. The second presentation was explaining to the public, what are we trying to achieve? So we were talking about, we want to understand how the hazards will change. And so that's where Pete talked about, uh, as he presented today, that we were going to look at storms and that we were going to look at ice changes, for example, and that we were going to identify where the vulnerable communities were, infrastructure and ecosystems. And most importantly, we wanted to communicate to the community that we really want to co-develop these climate change adaptation concepts and management options with you. And that we would be looking in terms of two different uh, characteristic shorelines or reaches, the high bluff reaches and the low flood, plain, uh, flood, flood prone lands. 
But as we did in each of the um, meetings, we also had an exit survey to sort of gauge how we did. And we had a really good, quite a good response, 81 out of 250. But then as people were leaving, leaving we also gave them a follow-up business card that had the information that they need to stay engaged in the process. And that business card um, identified one of the key means that people could keep up to date with the project, follow up with any kind of information that they heard through the grapevine on a presentation or the meetings that they couldn't attend. And it allowed, also allowed us to put the project presentations and reports and information up there to be transparent to the community. And so Chatham Kent has a let's talk um, website and we use that um, to highlight the study as you can see on the graphic on the right and then also to um, invite people to um, survey what we've done and also to alert them to what's coming any future meetings. We also um, when you do a presentation there's an awful lot of information for the public to take in and we had some critical key ideas that we want wanted for people to have the time to take in, assess, look at, and, and, and so forth. So we had, for the first um, meeting, we developed five um, posters, um, two of which I'm going to highlight here. The first one, you saw an, another version of that in Pete's presentation, where we wanted the people to realize and to see their community in the big scale to understand and see the processes of the sand movement and erosion, to understand that what they do in front of their place affects the broader community, the broader resilience. And so this is one of our traveling posters that went to each of the, the meetings just to reinforce the message and the information. And the first two um, meeting types, um, this was placed in the long corridor as people lined up to register and they could stand and look at that as well as when they're leaving to pause and look at more information. This is the second um, of the five traveling posters and this one was illustrating to people that there are already current impacts of um, flooding and erosion and so that people would be aware of that um, and, and address the current issue of high water levels and what people were experiencing. The second um, meeting was held in um, June 19th and 20th. We had four two and a half hour working sessions and working was in quotation marks. Um, Although we did do a presentation um, highlighting some of that risk and uh, damages that Pete showed about vulnerability, and also we presented um, some examples of avoid, accommodate, protect, and retreat adaptation options that have been implemented in other jurisdictions as a setup for our final uh, meetings when we would present the draft adaptation concepts to the community. It was part of the evolution of information and its timing that we planned as we presented it to the community. So this, this um, presentation, Pete did it four times um, over two days, is fairly intense for him, but there was an incredible amount of information that people could take in realize the um, severity of the potential impacts and that there is a requirement to do something about that. We also for the first uh, for the second um, meeting wanted to engage the community and have them think about um, how they see the flood and erosion vulnerability. We gave them dots to identify on these on a map where they thought were crucial or critical um, erosion and flooding vulnerability. 
that's really important for two points. It makes people reflect upon um, where in the community they think um, there are erosion and flooding risks, and also makes them stand back and realize that other people have different areas that they think are flooding, ha have flooding and risk uh, implications. And it's a good way to, to break the ice and have people talk about um, flooding and erosion. It gives us as the people who are implementing the, the research and understanding, trying to understand the community, we have a really good visual representation uh, of what the people think are high, high vulnerability areas for flooding and erosion. The meeting number two also had breakout groups. So we worked people hard. We had three questions that they had to address. Here is the results of one of the breakout groups, which was trying to get people to think about if you have to develop adaptations and you have to choose amongst them, what are some of the criteria that you could use to do that? And here is a word grant um, representation of some of the key criteria for addressing um, or assessing the adaptations. So that was presented out in a, uh, from, as a reporting out from the breakout, but then we also used the exit survey for the people to learn and think about what they had heard and, and experienced through the breakout groups and the reporting out to actually then fill out a survey to pick out their top three criteria from a list, which we then used in meeting number three to assess and called it the community criteria and used to actually address the adaptations. Here's just a very quick example from another um, breakout group question where we asked people if you pick a high bluff area and of the four sort of op big options, uh, which do you think is the most um, relevant for high bluff and low lying areas? And you'll see that for high bluff areas, they picked retreat, whereas in low areas, the community uh, picked accommodate. And here for this uh, meeting number two, we picked two more uh, traveling posters to allow people to have time to reflect on some of the information or the technical information. And Pete's already uh, presented uh, this to you, so I won't um, explain it in too much detail any further. This was another one because uh, an example of the bottom reflects low water level projections and the top high water level flooding for Shrewsbury. We just wanted to reiterate and reinforce that to be truly resilient, you have to consider both high and low water levels. Um, meeting number three was our most important meeting in a sense because we were going to be tabling the draft adaptation concepts. And we consciously made that word choice, the draft and concepts, to let the community know that they that their what they their input was valued and that these were draft and they were still concepts. We had two sessions at a larger venue that could host over over 200 people, and we had an afternoon and evening session. Um, we went through and made a presentation on those actual draft adaptation concepts by the four regions that Pete showed earlier. And also we had breakout groups um, where the community discusses and evaluates those adaptation concepts. As well, there would be reporting was reporting out so that everyone there could hear the highlights and the impressions and information from each of the different tables and get an appreciation of the range of views. And then also there was an exit survey where the participants could identify for their region, their preferred adaptation concept, and also uh, go through a checklist of assessing it for the community evaluation criteria. Just wanted to quickly show um, that in the presentation, the draft presentation, the draft concept adaptations were presented, and here's two um, different takes on what can be done, as Pete showed. There's the protect and then there's the transformative. But we also really wanted to communicate to the community 
the cost of the adaptation and the pros and cons uh, of actual impl implementation of this uh, draft concept. I think it's really important that the community appreciate cost and what the, the benefits of doing something, but also the consequences of doing something to help them understand why things might not be as beneficial, for example. And then at the breakout tables, they focused on one region. People pre-identified and sat down at a table that was numbered one, two, three, or four. At each of those tables, we had a facilitator um, who was a local expert, a representative from Chatham-Kent or from the Conservation Authority. And there were specific resources at the table. On the right, you'll see an example of um, a, a page from the adaptation booklet that people would work through, avoid, protect, accommodate, or retreat, and discuss that and with the um, using the evaluation criteria and other concerns and ideas that they brought forward. And they really were asked to discuss and evaluate um, those different adaptations. Last, my last slide is um, moving forward. Uh, I've been working on climate change adaptation since the 1990s and um, with the with the one of the very first adaptation studies in the Great Lakes. And I must I must admit this study has been extraordinarily re rewarding um, from the community community leaders, Chatham Kent and the Lower Thames a Conservation Authority being true leaders and innovators and willing to innovate and think about this and that the community, the people who live within the community were very, very open and willing to discuss and learn and move this forward, even under extraordinary uh, situations such as the high water levels, erosion and flooding. So this community has really undertaken all of the pieces that we in the adaptation field um, think need to be done. They've undertaken vulnerability assessment, impact assessment, adaptation design, and they've developed community support. And one of the ideas that um, uh, is a bone of contention with me is that people often think that all adaptation is local. Well, adaptation locally is very important, but we also, and that Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is really bringing this forward, is that you need alignment within multiple different um, agencies who work at different scales and have different mandates. And so we really realized that to implement, and this is an opportunity to really implement an adaptation. The IPCC also uh, is saying that there's a lot of um, planning for um, adaptation, but very little implementation. So this Chatham-Kent shoreline study is a real opportunity to move from planning and design to actual implementation. And so, um, through the funding from the province, um, we can move this forward and advance the study and implementation. And another outcome of this study has been the Southwestern Ontario Shoreline Roundtable, which is bringing together different agencies to discuss um, the different mandates and the different needs. So thank you very much. Um, my pleasure to talk to you about this study and uh, turn it back over to our chairs. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate that. All right, let me do this. Oh, show my screen. Okay. Um, so thank you um, very much. Um, we know we went over a little bit. It's about five minutes after noon. Um, so we, um, behind the scenes, we've um, decided to open it up for about 10 minutes of questions, if that works for you and, and Pete. Um, and uh, so if people are interested and have a few questions, you can go ahead and type them into the question box. Um, so let me go back here. Okay, so our first question, I think it's directed for Pete. Um, if you wanna go ahead and unmute your line um, 
Let's see. Um, Pete mentioned no expectation. Oh, Pete mentioned no expectation of increased winds. I've heard from stakeholders who are convinced that winds will increase, sometimes citing more energetic atmosphere. Do you know of a particular source for this perception? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I don't. And you know, I, I should mention that there was several um, climatologists on the study from uh, from another firm. So not necessarily my uh, my personal expertise, but just some more context. And we looked at uh, pressure gradients from the global climate models, uh, the regional climate models as well. And the pressure gradients across North America are, are what drive these storms, the synoptic scale storms. And uh, when you compare these gradients for storms in the historical record and the ones coming out of the climate models, um, the gradients do not get any greater. And in fact, they decrease in some cases a few percentage points. Um, so, you know, that's the best we have. And we're talking about climate and the future and models. Uh, so all those caveats, but the, the best information we have about the future indicates that uh, the storms, the wind speeds, and the pressure gradients that drive storm surge and wave height uh, are not projected to get any greater. So that's that's really all we have to go on. That's the basis for that. It's outlined in the reports. The other thing to mention, which I think is interesting and related, but it's coming at it from a different way and from the data. Uh, in Ontario, we have uh, published records of our, star our storm surges and our, at our gauge records as we do in the United States. Uh, that was all reviewed by the provincial government in 1989. Um, and so we have uh, statistical analysis of storm surge extremes at all of our water level gauges on the Canadian side. We've gone through and updated a lot of those gauge records in the, uh, with 30 years of additional data for a number of locations, at least 10 in the last couple of years. And nowhere in the measured record in the last 30 years are we seeing that the storm surges are getting or have gotten greater. Um, than what we've seen historically. So we got two lines of evidence there, models for the future and actual measured data indicating that the severity of the storms is, is not getting greater. So um, that's the best we have to go on. Um, the point we're trying to make in the study though is that as the ice continues to melt, we're gonna get more exposure to storms. Um, so we're, um, but they're not projected to be uh, any more intense. That's the research that we've done. Uh, as we put in our reports, you know, there should be more research. Uh, we encourage other people to do things and challenge our findings too. So it's this is just really the beginning, the first really focused study of this kind on storms. And certainly uh, we can all benefit from more work being done in the future. Great, thank you so much. Um, now we have um, a couple questions that are related for Linda. Um, and they both have to do with climate skeptics, Linda. The first was, were there climate, climate skeptics present at the community meetings? And if so, how were they addressed or accommodated? And then the second question was, they were curious if you came across any cases of climate denial in the community and how you managed that. So those are pretty related. Sure, uh, great questions. I I often um, run into climate skeptics and in this particular um, study there were there was one gentleman who wasn't convinced but I think that they were living through an extreme event that one could they were aware of their vulnerability and um, recognized that there was a need for coastal planning and when you talk about less ice potential on the Great Lakes, I think that that made them realize that skepticism wasn't really, um, there was there was very little skepticism and they, they, they realized the results were valid. Great, thank you. And uh, here's a question for Pete. Um, you used, only one scenario, RCP 8.5. Um, wondering, given the uncertainties in climate change predictions and therefore future NBS and added and added 0.5 meter mean water level for the future vulnerability, perhaps other scenarios may be warranted. 
Yeah, uh, great question, and and uh, totally agree. And uh, as I said at the onset, we had uh, you know we had to do this very quickly um, on a on a consulting time scale, so we didn't have years and years to do the work or or money. Um, but uh, I think future work could certainly look at a different different scenarios. The the couple things to add to that: the work that Frank uh, Seglinex is leading at Environment Canada on on lake level projections for the future and net basin supplies and you know what is our best understanding of what's going to happen with rainfall and lake levels in the future. Um, he's been looking at uh, RCP 4.5 and 8.5. And, and generally the trends are consistent. Um, things are worse with 8.5, but uh, they're still bad with 4.5. So that was reassuring that work uh, you know, started, uh, the results were coming out after we got into this. Um, but I, I think that his work, which is not public yet, and it's not final, uh, but everything I've seen so far is, supports the approach we've taken and uh, reinforces the need to start planning for lake levels even higher than what we're dealing with right now. And, and we all know that it's been incredibly difficult to deal with what we have, but uh, the, the best estimates of the future are, are even higher conditions. And in some of his model simulations, it's almost as if we've got a, uh, because of uh, the in increase in rainfall, um, almost a, a sea level rise type curve in mean lake levels. And that's something that, that I've never seen before in any of the climate scenarios and any of this type of work is that uh, everything they've done to date has always suggested the lake levels are, will drop a bit um, and yet we'll still have variability. This latest round of work is suggesting that the mean lake levels are going to slowly increase into the future and we're going to have even wetter periods than what we've just uh, witnessed right now. So. Um, again, I, it, it's best for Frank to speak to all of this, but it's very important research and it speaks to the importance of doing this type of vulnerability work because really all the communities in the Great Lakes are incredibly vulnerable to what's just happened and currently happening um, on the Great Lakes. And so uh, how do we deal with even more water is, is the question. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um... And this is um, a question that I think it's a follow-up. What was the basis for the 0.5 meters for the climate change lake level? Right, so the work uh, that we based that on was the, the previous work that Frank and others had done at Environment Canada for the uh, International Upper Great Lakes study. And they had uh, done simulations for mid-century uh, where they uh, simulated the historical um, conditions and, and the precip and then ran that water through the routing model of the Great Lakes system to get lake levels. And then they did their mid-century um, simulations and then pushed all that water through the Great Lakes system with the routing model that deals with all the stage and discharge relationships at the connecting channels. And that work uh, showed that by mid-century, um, the, the sort of extremes on Lake Erie could be uh, half a meter higher. Uh, than what has happened historically. So that's that's where we came with the half meter. It, it sounds obviously like a big round number and it is. Um, there, There's no, one of the things we were faced with on this is that there's no real playbook right now on how to do this kind of work. So we had to make that up uh, as best we could as we went along and make good informed decisions with science guiding us and, and that's what we've come up with. Um, so, uh, I think you know from where I sit and Linda and everything we've seen and we're seeing with the various types of research projects by others, um, the current extremes are not what we need to plan for. Uh, and, and that's a very scary thought, but something that we all as managers of the lakes need to start wrestling with is that uh, the future uh, has projections with even higher levels than we've just experienced. Great, thank you so much. And with that, it is 12.15, so I'm gonna cut off questions at this point. But if any of you are interested, I'm sure, in talking more with uh, Pete or Linda, feel free to reach out to them. Um, and I think with that, we're going to end the webinar portion and move into our quarterly um, extended uh, subcommittee meeting for Annex 9 under the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. So thank you to you both.